Hi, I'm Satori Shakur, and here's what's coming up on One Detroit Arts and Culture. A new home for Detroit theater, the art of flower arranging, and a tribute to radio legend Dick Purton. It's all this week on One Detroit Arts and Culture. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you. Hi, and welcome to One Detroit Arts and Culture. I'm your host, Satori Shakur. Thanks for joining me at the new home of Detroit Public Theater on 3rd Street in Detroit. Coming up on the show, Jay Schwanke shows us the art of flower arranging and Dick Purton. But first, let's get to know this new space in Detroit. I am now joined by founders and co-artistic directors, Courtney Burkett, Sarah Claire Corporandi and Sarah Winkler. Welcome. And I know you're getting ready to open mm -hmm. and you look so calm. What's it like? <laughs> What's it like to be 54 hours away? It's uh, really exciting. There's just a lot of things still going through our head. We look calm, but we are not calm. There are many, many things left to do. And so we will be working up to the last minute. And really, we're just getting started, even at, at opening night. This is just the beginning of the work that we're going to do in this space. So we're excited. We're ready. Um, but there's still a lot of things to do. Well, congratulations. And I mean, I mean, you move to a different space but the vibe is the same. <laughs> and, so and if you can move that. a vibe yeah. where a vibe yes. comes, you are the vibe. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. Yeah, I think we had a really good thing going with our audience and uh, with the artists that we were bringing into the space. And, um, you know, it's important to us that we have a good vibe, that this is a place that people want to come and see world-class theater and that people want to work in um, and that we're, we're trying to really create something beautiful fit with and for our community. So hopefully people, it was a place that people feel welcomed in and want to spend time in. And I think that's something that we've talked a lot about when we began, you know, we had a mission and a vision and values. And there is also an aesthetic to DPT, not just what you feel as an audience member, but what it's like to work here, to collaborate here. Um, and it was really important to us as we looked at strategic planning and how we were going to grow, how we keep that close intimate vibe? How do we keep that heart and soul of DPT as our family grows bigger, as our reach grows wider? And so hearing you say that in this moment when we when we haven't even opened the doors yet is huge validation that like that soul of us is still here and we want to make sure that when every single person walks through that door you immediately feel that. It does feel like a hug. Yes. Oh, Thank oh, you. <laughs> that's so beautiful to hear. We keep We keep saying that we want this space to be a warm and welcoming performance hub. And so to say that it feels like a hug is exactly what we were going for. Thank you, Satori. Yes. <laughs> what type of shows do you produce here? One of our taglines a few years ago was sit down and make yourself uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And and that is um, that means can mean a lot of things, but we're gonna we are gonna challenge our audience and ourselves sometimes with our programming, um, and so it might be a little uncomfortable. You might think about it, you might get in an argument about it, you might get in a deep discussion, you might dream about it, right? So we want to make sure that we're pushing conversations forward um, and that we're telling stories of Detroiters that our community can relate to and take back out into the world with them um, and and process whatever we're processing together as a community. And we frequently use the words bold and relevant, and we've added the word urgent as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really, really important to us that, that, these, that the stories that we share with our DPT family and beyond are, are relevant. What performances are going to be happening in this beautiful space? 
So uh, we open with Mud Row, which is uh, very, very powerful and beautiful and sometimes very funny story about family and forgiveness and sisterhood. Um, and uh, then we move into a play called Nora by Heather Raffo, who, uh, who is coming here to star in the show. Uh, and that will be directed. Uh, that will be directed by Mike Mosalem, and then we move into the Peculiar Patriot mm -hmm. by uh, Lisa Jesse Peterson, and that is a show about. Uh, that is that is a woman. It's a, a tour de force solo piece. You know a little bit about those, <laughs> Satori, um, and uh, that's a show about um, the prison industrial complex and what um, what the prison system does to both incarcerated people and their loved ones. Yes. And then I'm gonna let Courtney answer about Passing Strange. Yeah, then we're closing our season with a musical called Passing Strange, mm -hmm. which we are so excited to bring to Detroit audiences. It's just a phenomenal play that was produced on Broadway a couple years ago. And it's about a young man um, journeying to find the real, a young artist and traveling all over the world and looking for, you know, trying to find what really matters. Um, but it's a real good time. So we're very much looking forward to closing the inaugural season in our new home with Passing Strange. All right, well, is there anything else you want to say before we open? Come to Detroit Public Theater. Tell everyone, please. Um, like, uh, there is a place in your life if there hasn't been um, before. You don't have to go to Chicago or New York or Stratford to see great plays. You can see them right here in the city of Detroit. So please come check out what we're doing at Detroit Public Theater. Detroit deserves this, yes. And everyone is welcome. Well, thank you so much. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. And we'll see you soon. Yes. All right. Next up. Detroit radio personality and broadcasting icon, Dick Purton, has a story to tell, and we'll hear it in a new program that premiered on DPTV called Detroit Remember When, a tribute to Dick Purton. In an excerpt from the program, friend and on-air cohort Big Al Muscovitz tells us how Dick found his way to Detroit to create his trademark radio style. My dad bought a floor model radio with a record player in it and a microphone. So when I saw that come in the house, I started to pick up the newspaper and read in the microphone. My parents would listen to me and they thought I was uh, really good. So <laughs> I believed them. And uh, from that point on, I just, I just was fascinated by radio. And um, I still am, to tell you the truth. When I was about eight or nine years old, I would take the bus from Kenmore five miles to downtown Buffalo. I thought it was more like 50 miles, to tell you the truth, at that age. I'd get off the bus, go to the Statler Hotel, go up to the 18th floor where Clint Buman was broadcasting in WBEN in Buffalo, which my parents listened to. That's why I knew the station. Hello, everyone. Good morning to you, and welcome to the Clint Buhlman Show. If the engineer answered the door, I would explain who I was and that I was just wanting to see Clint broadcast his show, but he wouldn't let me in. Then when Clint would answer the door, he'd always let me in. So I did that about three, four, five times, and then I'd take the bus back to Kenmore, and uh, I never told my parents I did that because I was afraid they were going to say, you're not allowed to do that. Dick headed to Syracuse University. But most weekends, you'd find him hitchhiking back to his high school sweetheart, Gail. He excelled in what else? Radio, where he was a couple years ahead of Ted Koppel. You know, those of us who were underclassmen in those days, we really, really, really did look up to Dick Burton. He was an idol. I think he had a show on a commercial radio station in downtown Syracuse, WOLF. Wolf. And Dick had a, a morning show. It turns out Dick was a funny radio morning man right from the get-go. The kind of morning shows uh, that would later be done by people like Bob and Ray. I think Dick Burton was doing that before they ever even came on the scene. Dick did some time in the Army, rising to captain. Later, a master's degree, then on to stops on the airwaves in Buffalo, Jacksonville, and Cincinnati. I moved from uh, Jacksonville to Cincinnati because it was too hot. The summers in Florida I had never experienced before. Ooh, is it hot. It was 1964. Cincinnati. Dick, the afternoon man at WSAI. Since he's fun, sound up, 1360. 
an Indianapolis radio station tried to hire him. Dick didn't go, but he did get the inside track on an upcoming Beatles tour of America. The radio station in Indianapolis were sponsoring the Beatles in Indianapolis. I said, really? He said, you know, you could do that for Cincinnati, I suppose. I said, yeah, I suppose I could. Dick Purton and WSAI brought the Beatles to Cincinnati. The Beatles are coming to town, and this is Monday, April 20th. They'll be here on uh, Thursday night at Cincinnati Gardens. You know, he sold out naturally, and we knew we would. We knew we'd get our money back. So we met the Beatles and in the green room and all that kind of stuff, and it was quite a thrill. It wasn't as big a thrill for us guys, I think, as it was for about 15,000 young girls who populated the, the venue. The top ticket price for the Beatles was $5.50. Then it was like four twenty-five, and then it was three something, and then two something, and that was it. That's what they paid the kids to see the Beatles. I wanted to come to the Motor City, and the reason was my dad, in his line of work, would come to Detroit a lot from Buffalo. On occasion, he would invite me to come along with him. I just got to know the city of Detroit. It always stuck with me. A guy named Gary Stevens who happened to be from Buffalo, but he was doing the afternoon on WKNR. They did a good job, and they said they went from worst to first in the ratings in like 30 days. If there's one thing that makes WKNR the most listened to station in Detroit, it's the music. No, it's the concert. Anyway, I called up Gary in Detroit, and I said, hey, I'm looking to get out of Cincinnati. I understand you're leaving, and uh, who do I talk to? We have another winner! WKNR wanted Dick Purton, and they made him an offer. And I turned it down, and they said, yeah, you flew up here, didn't you? Weren't you interested in the job? And I said, yeah, but I said, I'm not sure I'm right for three to six in the afternoon. That's more teen time on the radio, at least on that station in Keener. Then they offered me seven to 10 at night. I turned that down. Then they offered me 10 to one at night. This is over a period of about a month. And ended up doing the late night, 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. show. The Dick Curtin Show of WKNR, Kena 13 and all that blah, blah, blah. 10 away, WKNR time. More music more often and all that stuff. Well, like everybody in Detroit, I grew up listening to Dick on our beloved Keener 13, WKNR. I remember as a young fellow, 11, 12 years old, listening to this, this new show, and I thought, what a talent. Scotty Regan preceded me at Keener 13. WKNI Scott Regan show with gobs of music passing before your very ears. And they had a contest, big contest about him and so forth on the station. Scott Regan comes in with a skateboard contest and Dick Burton says, I got to follow this guy. I don't have a contest. What am I going to do? So I had to come into town and nobody had ever heard of me before. And so I might add that a lot of people in this town still haven't. And uh, so I have invented my own contest called the Picture Contest. So what you do is draw a picture of what you think I look like. I had an 8x10 glossy from WSAI in Cincinnati from where he came. A.R. Vulo. Uh, Vulo Jr. 3. Anyway, uh, uh, Art, if you're listening, you don't win, baby. I was crushed because I, I, I knew I had the best picture, but he probably knew that I had cheated. <laughs> I was kind of doing the same thing when I got to Jacksonville. When I got to Cincinnati and when I got to Detroit, it was, it was, I decided that the radio that I was hearing that I was even doing a lot of myself, I didn't think was very good. So when I got to Detroit, I researched the city as best I could, from the mayor and the city council, just anybody and anybody who, who had a name that I might have some fun with. It felt like uh, I knew the city, and uh, so it felt like home. It, it just did. Thank you. Somebody at the door, maybe it's Tom. Come in, Tom. Guess what? The switchboard was right across from the main studio, and Dick liked to keep the door open. He, you know, it was just easier when he and I could see each other. Tom Ryan is batting the telephones tonight, girls, and Tom is uh, very adorable. And I was doing the 10 p.m. to 1 a.m. show for the first two months that I was here. 
And so I got to know Tom, and I got to realize that Tom did voices. He did characters. He loved to put people on the air. Because that's the way he was. He did, loved to talk to people, and they re request records. So we would get occasionally somebody who sounded pretty weird or everything, and I would give Dick, call line two, take line two. And then, well, then occasionally on a slow night, nothing was happening. I'd get on the phone from the switchboard, and I'd say, Dick, line three, there's a guy there. And he'd say, okay. He would tape the call, and I would say, hey, Mr. Parton, uh, that's a Zaddy from Taylor, and I want you, and, and he would lead me on. Then he realized it was me. I would then uh, start the bit, and then Tom would join him with the voice, and uh, that's how it worked. You're on the Swing and Sweeney show. That's hardly pretty, but you know, best we can offer in the morning, that, nobody else will get up. Swing and Sweeney was our morning man. Right now. You're swinging with he gets fired, so WKNR says to Dick, you're going to be the new morning man. And Dick said, I want that switchboard guy to be my voice man and producer. And that's how we started. Hello. This is Dick Perton on the air every morning on Keener from 5 until 9. Goodbye. I remember one time at Keener, we had a program director who told him not to do this certain thing. He said, no, that's, that's me. That, that's what I do. And he said, if you don't like it, I'll tell you what, I'll quit. I'll leave. I'm, I'm out the door. I'll leave tomorrow. I'll go back to Cincinnati, where I was from. And the, the, the guy panicked and said, oh, no, 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 That's, you, you go ahead and do it. You had to fight your own battle. I did, it, I did it my way. You can see Detroit Remember When, a tribute to Dick Purton at OneDetroitPBS.org. Up next, the power of flowers. Let's go to the Grand Rapids area, where WRCJ Cecilia Sharp visits Jay Schwanke host of the PBS series, Life in Bloom. He shows Cecilia how to create a flower arrangement and talks with her about how anyone can create their own beautiful arrangement any time of the year. Take a look. I am here with the host and creator of the television show, Life in Bloom, as well as the author of Fun with Flowers, Jay Schwanke and he's going to show us how to make a flower arrangement with these lovely flowers that he has right here before us. So, Jay, you've got some great stuff here. Right. Let's make an arrangement. Awesome. So this is all out of the garden. Okay. So that's this time of year. That's what's going on. So we've got, and typically when you might make an arrangement, you could make it loose inside here with just water inside. You could use flower foam that you've soaked and put inside here. Today we're gonna to work with chicken wire. So what we would do is we take a piece of chicken wire and we kind of form fit it and we drop it down in the lip of this vase. Then that provides a structure inside there that will hold our flowers in place. We're gonna start with the, with the greens that we have. And so greens always are the first thing that I do in an arrangement because I want that greenery to help form a structure. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna make what some people call a two-sided arrangement. So it's gonna be taller on two sides and it's going to be lower in the middle. All right. Alrighty, a two-sided arrangement. A two-sided arrangement. Now the other thing I love to do is I love to forage in the yard. This is actually a spirea bush that doesn't have any blooms left on it. So, but these are what's left afterwards. It's a pretty fuchsia color. It's still fun to be able to use something like that, right? And so, we will use that. I'm removing all the leaves that would fall below the water line when I stick it down inside there. Why do you do that? Number one enemy to flowers is bacteria. Okay. So if we have leaves that fall below the water line, they're gonna degrade very quickly. And so that will cause bacteria in the water, which is gonna shorten the base life of our flowers. If we remove it, then we got clean stems going down inside our water. And so it will remain cleaner longer. So I have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. How can people learn how to make arrangements? Aside from, of course, watching Life in Bloom. I have a YouTube channel, okay. Jay Schwanke's YouTube channel. Okay. It's a great opportunity because there's hundreds of videos there that literally teach you. And I have a whole series of From the Garden. So you can learn about different types of flowers that you have in the garden. We do some specifically with zinnias, some with dahlias, some with different types of flowers so that you can learn how to use those. And I think that that's really important for people because it, YouTube's great because it gives you short little snippets and you can save it and you can work with it later. So that's good too. Is that a hosta? It is a hosta leaf. Okay. Okay, so one of my favorites from the garden because it's just, it gives us a really big 
grounding point for our arrangement right here. And having that guy up there, it's gonna give us a visual spot for our eye to rest. Okay. I smell something, it smells really good. Does it smell like pineapples? This is pineapple sage. Oh, that smells great. Right? So I love pineapple sage, it's variegated, has those beautiful little blooms on it. So now we're gonna use some of our zinnias and our, and these beautiful little black-eyed Susans. One of my favorites, because it makes us happy, right? I love the colors. Those flowers make us happy. The orange and the fuchsia. Yeah. Oh, the green one is beautiful. Isn't it true, right? Oh, Here. wow. Oh, thanks. Look, I mean, isn't it pretty? Green are one of my favorites because they are so, um, they're unexpected. I think people are like, oh, yeah. where's that flower? Where did that flower come from? Right. Is that a green flower? Right, right. How in the world did we come up with a green flower? We've got to get this one in here. I love it. We're going to use two of these other softer green first. Okay. And remember, we're following this two-sided arrangement. So we've got it up here, and then it's going to get lower and tighter in here. There are so many people who will teach you how to do flower arranging. And I think that that's, that's an important concept about it. But I also think that you should find something that you really love, a method that you love with the flowers, and start to create that direction. Because when you do that, you're gonna continue to have a good feeling about what you're doing and you're gonna like what you're done. And so the other thing I always encourage people to is if you don't like where something goes, you can move it. You make us feel so good, Jay, about arranging flowers and believing in ourselves. You can have fun with it and make it what you want. It's the power of flowers. You're so right. What did you call that one again? Black-eyed Susan. Black-eyed Susan. So it's Susan. part of the um, Astracacia family, which has about 150 different things in it, including zinnias, oh. sunflowers, daisies, shasta daisies, all of those are in that family. Okay. So now I've saved a couple of special things for last. Okay, right? like what? So we have a piece of phlox okay. that looks like that. And that piece of phlox, um, I love these because they smell really good, if you wanna smell. Sure. Oh yeah, it's right? really fragrant. It is, it's pretty, and, and phlox, late summer, late summer bloomer. Okay. Okay. We're gonna put him in last, probably. Okay. Then we have a spider, a laciniated dahlia, okay? Laciniated. Laciniated, which means that as these petals come out, they're gonna look like they were shredded on the end. So they're like lace, right? And that's gonna be our focal flower. We're gonna put it right down here in the center of our bouquet, like, like nice and low. And then we've got this other little guy. And this is a, this is a collarette type of dahlia which is also looks like a daisy. So the interesting thing about dahlias is there's thousands of species of dahlias. Jay, you make this look so easy. I think that's very interesting because people say that to me a lot. And I think it's simply practice. I think I've made maybe thousands, if not millions of flower arrangements because I make a flower arrangement every single day. Every day. And that's just a way of practicing. So everyone can make it look this easy. You're gonna find things that work. You're gonna find things that don't work. And so our listeners and our viewers can do that too. If you take the time to enjoy the process and feel the release of this, those endorphins. Because people say to me all the time, I felt so good while I was making the arrangement. Exactly, that's the power of the flowers. That's what they do. That's how they help us create a flower lifestyle. Jay, thank you so much for thank inviting you. me into your home. Thank and you for coming. Absolutely. And for showing us how to make a wonderful flower arrangement, this two-sided flower arrangement, and talking about the benefits of flowers and how we can keep those flowers going every day, every season here in Michigan. Thank you so, so much. You can see Jay Schwanke's Life in Bloom on DPTV's Create Channels Sundays and Tuesdays. For more information about all of our arts and culture stories, go to our website at onedetroitpbs.org. Thank you for joining me and thank you to Detroit Public Theater for opening up their new home to us. I'll leave you with a performance from the new season of Detroit Performs Live from Mary Grove. The season premieres Wednesday, October 12th. Enjoy, and I'll see you next Monday.
Delta faucets to bare paint. Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support for this program is provided by the Cynthia and Essel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV, the Kresge Foundation. The DTE Foundation is a proud sponsor of Detroit Public TV, among the state's largest foundations committed to Michigan-focused giving. We support organizations that are doing exceptional work in our state. Visit DTEFoundation.com to learn more. Nissan Foundation and viewers like you.